Hey folks, Steve here with a special unboxing video for you today. We are going to be looking at something a little bit different. This is a game from Compass titled Burning Banners. Or I suppose more specifically, Christopher Muller's Burning Banners, Rage of the White uh, Witch... <laughs> Rage of the Witch Queen, goodness. A fantasy war game featuring six unique factions, including the Vampiric Army of the Night... The Marauding Orc Tribes, the Swarming Mountain Goblins, the Mighty Eastern Empire, the Northern Raiders of Fjordland, the Dwarven Kingdoms of the Oathborn. Oh, golly. <clears throat> this was a game that had uh, been on Kickstarter, and I decided to give it a shot. Um, because there's not very many fantasy war games, at least these days. Um, and maybe I'm missing out on a whole bunch, but... You know, we really don't have very many. I mean, you have War of the Ring, and that kind of feels like it's really it, other than maybe a few miniature games and some Game of Thrones stuff. Uh, but largely, you know, there there is an absence of fantasy. And I don't mean the hypothetical World War Three fantasy or the um, Axis powers invading America type of fantasy. Like, you know, magic and goblins and orcs and fun. Well, we have this game. Um, and it's a very heavy box, I should point out. I was actually very surprised at how heavy the box was when it arrived. Um, there's a bunch of, like, context here. Um, you can already see, you know, it, yes, this is, this is fantasy. This is not, uh, World War II, World War I, or anything like that. There will be hexes, there will be counters, and apparently some cards. So if we look at this, complexity is low-medium. Time scale is four seasons per year, um, so I guess that, that feels like four turns per year, which is okay. It's seasonal turns. Um, map scale is one Imperial League per hex, so I, that's something I need to wrap my head around. Unit scale is armies and heroes. Number of players is two to six. Suitability for solitaire is a medium. And average time to play, well, one, hour, one or more hours, depending on scenario. Uh, which is kind of interesting, like, okay, there's clearly additional scenarios here. We'll have to look that up, uh, look at that. Uh, the game contents, 240 one-inch hand-drawn counters, 162 five-eighths inch uh, rounded counters. So these are going to be pretty big counters. Um, 65 coin counters, four 17 by 22 mounted hand-drawn maps with huge one and one-half Y inch wide hexes, so that'll be interesting to see. Two hundred and six playing cards, three roll, uh, three rule books or three books, a rules book, a campaigns book, and a lore book, which that'll be interesting to see. Six dual layered play mats, uh, four cardstock player aids, twelve white, six sided dice, eight black, eight sided dice, and six postcard art prints. Oh, so. A very different fare uh, than what we might usually see from Compass. So let's get the uh, plastic wrap off of this guy. Um, so I'll just say this is a pretty deluxe feeling box. So um, so far as Compass Games box goes, uh, it is a different size format form factor than your typical sort of bookshelf case uh, style boxes it's a little wider so um, it might not sit flush with the rest of your uh, games from compass so it is a very different sort of monster um, let's get the lid off and we'll see what we get here um, all right there's some cards here we'll see if we can get this uh... oh yeah we'll just rip that that's fine all right, Lilith, Queen of the Army of the Night. Okay, uh, these so these must be the art prints. So, and then we've got a Weasel Eyes of the Goblins. All right, Weasel Eyes. Finger Cutter of the Goblins. Hagator, the Red Eagle of Oathborn. All right. So get some trousers on that guy. Sorry, there we go. Uh, Bella of the Th Bella of the Thor Jotunson of Fjordland. Okay, clearly a Viking. Uh, Bella of the Army of the Night. I don't know. She looks suitably creepy. 
Oh Lord, all right. Yeah, well, for art prints, I mean, they're if you want to get a good look at a leader, maybe uh, that's what these are for. Um, Gameplay wise, not sure what uh, what that will be. Um, we do have a, another plastic sleeve for the rule books. I think that was to help protect them. So let's stop for a second and look at this. So, Traveler's Guide. This is the lore book, I would think. Now, okay. In a historical game, you would tend to have, and, I'm, and obviously I'm doing this unboxing in the context of a wargaming hobby, um, usually there's like historical notes. So, I, you know, for a fantasy war game, um, the historical notes kind of by definition have to be replaced by, you know, lore information. And so, um, okay, we're talking about Twin Realms, uh, the gods of this world... It's got some art in here. Read all about those things. So it definitely feels a bit like, you know, this is not just maybe a game in a vacuum. It's here's lore, here's playing this game. The fact that this is being specifically titled Rage of the Witch Queen um, kind of implies maybe there'll be more of this sort of thing in the future. And coverage on rulers, villains... Probably figures who show up in the game one way or another. So if you want to get, you know, into more than just, hey, I'm playing the goblins. Who are all these goblins? Uh, there's some some detail there. And, uh, oh, Lord of the City of the Dead. Osterloch. Yeah, all right. A little different. A little different, folks. Uh, here's the rule book. So this is... Uh, this feels, yeah, glossy paper, so it's going to, like, kind of higher quality, um, though it may mean we're not writing in the columns for errata or anything. Uh, on the back there are unit ratings, so army combat rating, two white squares, oh, there must be, like, dice, so we're going to roll two white dice and a black eight-sided die, um, and a weakened army, so we take a step loss, I guess, and then you have a weakened army on the back. Units can be fragile. They can have abilities like stealth or range, which is indicated by symbol. And then there's an advanced game that involves heroes. Rolls appear to be in a two-column format. And full color. So it looks like, if I look at the table of contents, that the rules themselves... Take up you know, the basic game, just to get playing the game, it is 24 pages of rules. The text is actually decent-sized font. So, you know, if I were to compare this to other war game, like, we're probably looking more like, you know, 20 pages of a of maybe a standard war game rule book. Um, and then the advanced game, which appears to introduce heroes, monsters, additional cards, um, that is another 20-some pages on top of that. So... Um, I don't really have much in, in terms of uh, knowledge of how this game works. Um, I, I kind of went, went in on the Kickstarter. I've not done all the ho homework on this, but um, I'll be interested to see kind of what are all the different campaign options um, to play the game. If there's different, you know, it says here, like you're going to choose a campaign. Um Consult the campaign book and decide which campaign you wish to play. There are dozens of campaigns. Dozens of campaigns. So I guess depending on how many players you have and what you're into, there's many different ways to play this game, which I like the idea of that. That's cool. Um, talking about unit abilities. Posture, looting. Raised markers. So you can deal damage to an area, to settlements. Action phase. I mean, when I look at, so you can see, like, the type of actions that you can take here. Um, certainly feels much like a war game that I'm, you know, maybe I'm used to playing. Control markers, uh, movement, you know, playing of cards maybe as an additive thing. You know, nothing too crazy there. Um, and even here you can see there's... Text around road movement and having to deal with uh, 
different types of hexes like river hexes that may allow either serve as a barrier or a way to do ship movement. So, you know, there's an operational model here that appears to be very similar to things as a wargamer we might be very used to seeing. Um, talking about ship movement and, I mean, gosh, you know, you could imagine this being, I'm sorry, my focus is a real pain today. Um, you can kind of see this looking very similar to a lot of other operational type of games in a war game context. So this is all looking very, very much in line with the kind of thing we would expect to see. Um, advance after combat type of stuff here. Ambushes, building armies, and then talking about uh, the specific kingdom so this is like okay if you're playing the oathborn which i think were the dwarves okay they can do they have special mechanics for them the lost city of kazud um obviously you know a lot of a lot of uh, influence from popular uh myth lore <laughs> and fantasy archetypes um so each faction has its own set of important um Oh, Commander Stage is a coup? Interesting. Um, you have different ways uh, to play as each faction. They have different mechanics for each one that may uh, that may help differentiate the game. And we have the advanced game where we're adding more things in like the cards. All this. I don't want to spend too much time here just showing that there's like there. There's a lot of game here, uh, a lot of information to absorb to play the game. It and, and just reading through the rules and seeing how the rules are arranged, like it, despite it looking very different, um, it does feel quite a bit like a war game in terms of the reading. Now here's the campaign book. We're not going to spend a lot of time in here. I just want to look and see. All right, so we have campaign introduction. Uh, it's like, it looks like there's a split between the kinds of campaigns to play. So an introductory campaign that you can learn the systems and, and self-contained campaigns from different periods in the timeline. So it gets back into the lore, like, okay, there's a timeline, there's a different series of events um, that you can follow along with. And then there's the Chronicles of the War of Burning Banners, which sounds like that's maybe more of the big show. Um... Not sure. I'm definitely going to have to sit down and read through all this. This looks looks interesting. I mean, I like... I don't know. I'm a lore guy. So when it, when it comes to, like, anything, um, any, like, fantasy or sci-fi uh, milieu, like, I, I do uh, really, really like... Um, I do really, really like lore... Uh, and then getting into that and kind of like, oh, there's a timeline and when what event happens when this happens. It does look like there's a weird, like, I don't know if this is an intentional way that the page is set up or if maybe something was goofed there. I don't know. Um, okay, so uh, introductory campaign. It's showing uh, who sets up and... Opening builds. Oh, so I think it's it's allowing you to set up your builds, like you build what you want, maybe where. So each one of these camp introductory campaign scenarios is like really the information provided is one page worth, and they each have a victory condition. They each have a good little chunk of flavor text. Um, looks like maybe there's some left behind layout stuff there but it's not on every page um yeah so some of this stuff all looks all looks interesting i mean I, you know I, it's hard it's hard to know what to think of this because i need to see the game in action um but when i look at all these different campaigns like oh wow you could definitely spend a lot of time playing through this and figuring out uh how to how to do it um so, unfortunately, um, as you, there's a lot here. I I suddenly feel very inadequate to talk about this game because there's, it really feels like there's a lot in here that I am, I am only partially educated on. 
Um, but I'm very interested to see what all this looks like. And there are design notes, which um, is going to be a really interesting read and try to understand some of the design intents. And you can see some of this already talking about, you know, what how monsters affect the game, what was the design thinking. Uh, so I, I like that right away. I can say that looks very cool. Um, let's see what else we have. Okay, so there are... There is a plastic wrapper, and I'll just bust that right now, um, around the counter sheets. And let me tell you that these counters are super thick, just based on the width here. Whoa. Oh, okay. All right, first things first. Here's these player, I don't know what you want to call them, player decks. So... I'm playing the Army of the Night. If you see here, there's... This is kind of something new I'm seeing in a lot more games. These are sort of like inset cut boards. So I assume like I can place a card in here. I can place counters in here. And they'll kind of bounce around inside the, the lip of this. Um, and there's a separation between basic and advanced. So it looks like each player has one of these, which is kind of cool. It's a very, you know... Uh, kind of neat approach. There's a couple more. Every faction, I think, is going to get represented here. Eastern Empire, Fjordland, Goblins. Let's see, is this six? Yeah, it's six. So each player's got their own sort of command center player sheet, player card. Um, here's a magic card display. It's a pretty thick board, so it is like it is a board to place the magic cards. However, that really gets used. And then we have a sort of um, administrative track, so tracking the turns, uh, tracking the seasons. Well, it does actually look like maybe there's multiple turns per season, so maybe I'm getting some things wrong here. Income tracks, all stuff that you know we maybe not. Not surprising to see, um, but it's given its own board, so depending on what map you're using, um, you can play with whatever you need. And then here are the counters, and just, like, these are really big counters. Let me get the zoom right. So, oh, we got some Valkyries, Berserkers, Sea Reaver, and very thick, by the way. And I suspect... Oh, crap. All right, well, that was easy. Um, well, we just punched our first counter in the set. The nubs are practically non-existent. Like, I can't even feel them. So these counters are going to punch out really nice, and they're going to punch out easy. This is like, this is very good, uh, very good counter quality in terms of how this thing is punched and arranged. Like, it just popped right out, and there's no, like, I can't really feel the nub. Maybe a little bit right here I can feel a nub, but it's like, it's pretty much non-existent. And that's just like, all right, that's a counter. There we go. Um, let's see, I gotta set this guy in a safe place so I don't lose him. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so okay, counter sheet one. So this is Eastern Army and some of the Fjordland people. And then there's some more different faction on uh, counter sheet two. Again, similar, similar type of stuff. And so on and so forth. I mean, I just looking over the counters, it, you know, it would be hard to say, like, is there any known errata on anything? Um, but it's all all looking good. And then here's a set of smaller counters, control markers that are a little bit smaller, maybe closer to the, you know, those other size counters we read on the back of the box. They're smaller. Um, looks like they're going to punch out just as easy and, and be in good shape. So the counters look really, really good. I'll say that. They look really, really good. Let's see. Oh, well, we got our dice. I don't think there's anything too particular or special about that. Other than I do think it's interesting that we're actually doing the uh, numeric characters and not pips. At least on the six-sided dice, but everything is relatively uniform there, so that's nice. Um, now, there's, there's a bunch of cards here. Um, I'm a little afraid to try to bust these open. But you can see, because uh, I'm, I'm not ready to organize the cards. Uh, Fierce Forelander, Fjordlanders are master sailors and explorers. 
Um, stacks containing Fjordland Raiders pay one movement point to enter forest hexes and gain one white die when attacking into or defending into forest, so these guys operate better in the forest. Um, it's kind of hard to tell. Is this just like an all-the-time card, or is this, like, is it a player aid card, or is it more like you got to play it? Here's your uh, battle magic. A caster stack doubles the white dice and its combat rating. Hmm. Um, so there's a lot. Okay, more spell cards. Heat Ray, Battle Magic, Target Unit, Monster Gear, so reduces its combat rating. Okay, so that's like a debuff card. Um, I think these are. this is a nice, for me, not ripping open these uh, card decks themselves. This is a nice little sampling. Um, so Storm God's Hammer, Caster gains one white die or gains one black die in combat with a monster or hero. Um, so obviously that'll... That'll help mix things up it, rather than it just be simply a, a numbers on counters kind of game that, you know, if you're going to be dealing with fantasy, you might as well do uh, some interesting things with it. Now, I'm going to point out, before we start looking at these maps, that they are named. And so this is the Broken Coast. That's the Imperial Heartland. It looks like there's going to be, yeah, four of these. I'm going to carefully unfold one. And just see what this is going to look like. I have no idea if these maps connect or not. But here, it's like you're almost getting a, you know, Copenhagen, Denmark, and then Sweden up here. Um, this is not, not historical. This is not a map of the world. This is pure fantasy. But you can see the layout here. It's actually quite a pretty looking map. Um... So there are forests where those rangers would come in handy. There's towns, uh, or at least, you know, maybe that's a fortress. Um, so there, there are clearly uh, points of interest on the map that are going to be controlled by different factions. And if I just try to, you know, if I were to try to guess at the situation... Um, like, are the dwarves going to start up here? Well, maybe. Um, it's really hard to kind of derive much from this, but terrain is clear on the map for the most part. There, um, we do see the rivers. We do see, uh, they either control icons on the map, denoting who controls what. Um, like, it does seem like these are dwarven holdings up here, and then... The Fjordlings over here. So that being the Broken Coast. I'm going to get another map. I'm going to see... I'm going to see what that, this next one looks like. And so there's... The Imperial Heartland. Uh, which is looking like this. Um, I could not discern a way to connect the two maps just looking at them at the moment um but well maybe uh oh i see this map goes underneath the other one so i wonder if i can get this to show or at least it looks like it does um i could be wrong see yeah they do connect so there you go um and then i suspect the other two maps i'm not going to be able i did not set up my table to accommodate all these maps together so i'm not going to be able to do that uh in the unboxing video but this is at least a, a glimpse at you know the fact that i'm sure some scenarios will be able to be played on just one of the maps and then we have, again, two more maps, um, as well as a terrain effects chart, combat resolution player aid, and this opens up, kind of hitting a lot of different points of the game mechanics, but that was in there too. Um, but so you have these, uh, it, or there's two of them. And then these other maps here. So there is, uh, where's the label here? Uh, 
the wild lands. It looks like maybe this is the east. Well, the uh, the first two maps we looked at were maybe the um, western maps, and then this is going to be one of the the eastern maps. So the wild lands, and then finally the. Fields of Ash. So, you know, out of everything that's here, um, it looks like there's a, quite a big, strong city down there. Um, you know, I, it's really hard to, to articulate anything about these other than the biggest campaigns in the game probably make use of all four maps, in which case uh, you're talking about a pretty big-sized table to, to hold everything together. Um you know, I have, for my purposes, I've got the map and table, or I've got the table space for the maps, because um, I've got Axis Empire set up. But um, this could be something that, uh, even if you don't have the room to set up all four maps and play the big six-player campaigns, you can certainly, it looks like, play on one or two maps together, and uh, probably have a pretty good time just playing that. So that's kind of interesting. Um, modular at least, which is helpful now. Um, something that still sticks out to me as a, as a question will be like, okay, is this the beginning of something that's going to continue on? You know, it, it does look like where the map stops, even if you said those are the four maps of the game, uh, you could, you could do more. You could expand, you know, just because the map ends there doesn't mean the world ends there. And so there's probably a lot more that um, can come into the game experience, but uh, I guess they'll, we'll have to see how well this performs with, with Compass and what the uh, adoption rate is for the game, if folks are really into it. It looks like everything's just going to fit uh, pretty nicely back in the box without you know much in the way of pain. Um, so as I'm just looking to get this back in. I guess I should put my rule books in. Yeah, everything, everything is looking like it's going to go back in just fine for the moment. Now, what will be interesting is, you know, once the, once the counters get punched, is there a good way, oh, there goes a box fart. Um, will there be a good way to sort the counters that That'll fit in the box real nice. I mean, will a normal counter sheet work? I have to assume Cube for me is probably going to have some nice way to organize those counters. But there's not so many that it feels like you're going to be overwhelmed. So this is something very, very different, guys, um, from Compass. And, and I'll say, like, kudos to Compass for pushing outside um, maybe the comfort zone. I know that like GMT is was going to try to do that with a game and then they really didn't. Um, I'm glad to see that somebody is really making a real attempt at something. It, it's a uh, fantasy world that I think is unique to just this title. Um, so it's not relying explicitly on an existing license. Um, it's still, you know, it's, it's going to have fantasy elements that are all pretty familiar to people who play any sort of fantasy game. So you're not going to be bizarrely, you know, out of, out of expectation probably for what's here. Um, so I, I'm very interested to see what I can do with this. I, I like the idea that it is, it can do two players, it can do up to six, you can play with smaller maps, you can play with the bigger maps, you can, there's clearly like a storyline to play through the campaign um, and art, kind of articulate like what's happening in this world and the lore book kind of helps you connect to it. I like that. That might seem like something, I don't know. I, I it, it, It's unfair to, I guess, I don't know, to compare it to, to history games, right? Because if you play an Arden game, well, you know, it's the Battle of the Bulge. And everyone's going to, you can read about the Battle of the Bulge. Um, for a game like this, where you really have to put, you know, some context to the players, and it's not just, you're not just the goblins. It's here's where this is what the goblins are in this world. This is their role. This is their history. This is why you may or may not like this other faction. I, I think that is good. Like you want to make it. You want to give this 
identity, um, even if it's, you know, pretty, you know, pretty standard fantasy type affair um, to, to give the player something to latch on to. So Rage of the, of the Witch Queen, I'm going to have a hard time saying that for some reason. Wh Rage of the Witch Queen, I think I keep thinking Witch King, like World of Warcraft or something, but Rage of the Witch Queen, Burning Banners, the first uh, real, you know, clear uh, fantasy war game in some time, in my estimation, at least that I'm aware of. I'm very excited to give it a shot, I, and I, I think because of what it is, it's actually going to be a lot easier to convince people to play it um, than to drag somebody into a, you know, here, here's this big complicated World War II monstrosity game. Like, hey, no, this is something a little bit different. It's gonna, it's got a little bit more of a wider uh, audience, maybe. And um, I kind of, I think I want to maybe take this to a local uh, nerdy bookshop in my local area and and see what folks may think of this. Um, so, <clears throat> anyway, thanks for watching, guys. I hope this unboxing video was useful to you, so you could see what the components look like coming out of the box. Um, I would like to do some coverage of this at some point in the future. I, I don't know what shape that will take yet. I've got a full schedule of games that I need to be playing at the moment, but um, we'll we'll see. I'm really glad to see this arrive uh, from the Kickstarter and um, a lot of possibility here. So thanks for watching. Take care. Keep gaming. Catch you later.